This presentation is available for MCLE self-study credit. If you would like to receive credit, you must take three actions. First, click the show more text below on our YouTube page. The text will expand and show a link to download the handout materials. Once you finish watching this presentation, please click the quiz link to receive self-study credit. Once the quiz is successfully completed, you will receive a certificate via email within 72 hours. We hope you enjoy the presentation. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. For those of you who are just tuning in, my name is Hayward Cho, and I am the General Manager of ADR Services, Inc. I will also be acting as your MC and host for today. Uh, before we move on to the next program, I would like to briefly remind you of the following few housekeeping items. Uh, first, written materials are av available on our website at ADRservices.com. Um, I will also post in our channel periodically the written materials, so you will be able to download uh, through there. MCLA certificates will be sent via email by end of day tomorrow. You do not need to sign in. Your attendance is captured through your Zoom. Programs are recorded and will be made available for self-study MCLA credit on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can attend some or all programs today and claim participatory credit for any that you attend. Please submit your questions using the Q&A functions through Zoom. And for any technical questions, please feel free to email us at mcle at adrservices.com. All right, so now I have the pleasure of introducing our next presenters, Carmen Alberio, Ed Weiss, and Chris White on legal ethics in an evolving landscape. Just a reminder, this is a two-hour ethics program. So first, I have Carmen Alberio. She is a recognized expert in the field of probate estates and trust law with 36 years of experience as a probate attorney for the Los Angeles Superior Court. As a probate attorney for the court, Ms. Alberio worked closely with over 55 judges presiding over probate matters, providing instrumental assistance with the preparation and review of matters coming up for hearing. Her intimate understanding of the proceedings make her an exceptionally knowledgeable and effective mediator of trust and estate disputes, where she is able to provide invaluable evaluation to her dispute resolution practice. Among the many judges that Ms. Alberio had the pleasure of working with at the, at the court is the Honorable Craig Carlin, and she is thrilled to be teaming up with him again at ADR Services Inc. to co-mediate probate, estates, and trust matters. Next, we have Edward Weiss, a highly accomplished attorney with over 30 years of diverse legal experience, is renowned for his expertise in mediating and arbitrating disputes. Since 2021, he has committed his full attention to dispute resolution, also volunteering as a mediator for the Los Angeles Superior Court. A former federal prosecutor, trial lawyer, and business leader, Mr. Weiss has excelled in antitrust, business, employment, entertainment, consumer protection, intellectual property, real estate, and securities law. His extensive background includes an 18-year tenure as general counsel for Ticketmaster, the last 11 of which he was general counsel or chief counsel, where he played a pivotal role in navigating complex litigation and safeguard, safeguarding propriety technology. <clears throat> Mr. Weiss holds a JD from the University of California, Berkeley School of Law and an AB in political science from the same institution. And lastly, Chris White practiced law for over 30 years and earned a reputation as one of the top civil litigators in California. As an experienced trial lawyer and litigator and a VOTA member, he has handled and tried a wide variety of cases, including, but not limited to, personal injury matters, construction defect claims, and catastrophic loss cases, which included fatalities, paralysis, traumatic brain injuries, and amputations. As an attorney and as a mediator, Mr. White has been involved in more than 800 mediations, in addition to his volunteer work presiding over dozens of settlement conferences and hundreds of civil trials for the Orange County Superior Court. As a mediator, Chris blends his, blends his extensive civil litigation background and trial experience with his practical, optimistic, and determined nature to effectively resolve disputes. He is known as a closer. He gets cases settled, which is why he is such a sought-after mediator. All right, Pete, uh, speakers, passing it on to you. Thank you, Hayward. Good morning. Uh, and good morning to everyone out there. Uh, my name is Chris, and I'll be kicking off uh, the first part of the presentation. Uh, we have our first slide. 
and uh, you'll see our agenda to give you an overview of where we'll be going. Uh, my first part of this will be on civility. So I'll handle point one and folks will be jumping in. So civility, why does it matter? Well, let me, let me acknowledge something that I think all of us are experiencing um, in American society, and that's the coarseness of civil discourse uh, in maybe every area that we come into from uh, politics to school boards to conversations on cable news to Congress to everywhere. And uh, I would suggest that uh, maybe civility is more needed and more important than it's ever been. So um, if you'll allow me, I know we're going to hit on some stuff. These will probably be very basic to most of you, but I want to just kind of go over some stuff. Um, my wife and I raised three kids. They're all uh, young adults now uh, getting on with life. But uh, when we used to sit at the dinner table, we frequently tried to think about, you know, how do you, how do you shape a young person's character? Uh, what, you know, what are the kinds of things that you can remind them of? And one of the things we used to do with our kids was ask them uh, very frequently, what'd you do for someone else today? You know, teenagers, that's not exactly a sweet spot for them to be other directed and think about others. And we found initially our kids, uh, you know, the reticence of teenagers, you know, uh, what, what kind of question is that? Um, and there was a little pushback initially because, uh, hey, I, I'm going to be seen as a, a, a goody two shoes. Uh, I think people are going to take advantage of me if I'm kind or if I'm other directed. Um, and we pushed back on that a little bit with our kids. And, you know, fast forward. Um, in years of conversation of that becoming kind of a regular question, we found our kids started to adopt that more naturally than we even suspected. And I think they took it on as, if you will, part of uh, their young identities of, you know, I'm someone who helps other people, or I at least think about it. And I look for opportunities to do that. And the only reason I'm making that connection is maybe civility settles with you of, come on, you know, uh, practicing law in California is tough and it's for it's for folks who are aggressive. You got to get the upper hand all the time. And if I'm civil, gosh, my client's going to suffer. I'm going to look weak or I'm going to lose some ground or lose an advantage. Uh, and at least the, the section that uh, Ed Carmen and I would like to talk about here with civility is we'd like to push back on that a little bit. And in fact, suggest that uh, civility does matter. So let's start with some of the basics. We have a slide as a reminder. Um, slide uh maybe something that a lot of the folks don't know who maybe were sworn in but before 2014 is that the the state bar actually had the california supreme court uh told the state bar recommended the state bar to actually change the oath which attorneys take and as you can see uh the highlighted words of dignity courtesy and integrity which you know for my money uh, aligns with civility for sure and I think there was an idea even then of, of we had to add those words in the oath because even in 2014, we were seeing uh, this coarseness, uh, this lack of civility occurring certainly in the practice of law. Um, so why does civility matter? And, and why is everyone talking about it? Um, I'd like to at least remind you that you've took an oath. We've got some uh, professional standards that I'm hoping uh, we'll pull up here. Um, I know Aboda has some professional standards. Um, and that gets harped on a great deal um, and why civility matters and codes of professionalism. Uh, principles of civility, integrity, and professionalism are emphasized. Um, things like your word is your bond. And, uh, you know, Aboda, which I'm privileged and fortunate and humbled to be a member of, you know, are a lot of experienced trial attorneys who are, who are very good and they represent their clients zealously uh, and get great results. And the commitment to being professional is just foundational uh, to the folks in this group. And then of course, our, our bar, uh, our local bar, and we picked some Orange County uh, and LA civility guidelines. And it's just, it's just emphasized um, everywhere. And so we're trying to remind people because I'm sure uh, you're experiencing it. Again, I, I, my word is coarseness. Uh, there's, there's just a lack of civility um, in society generally, and it's leaking over into the legal profession. So uh, we wanted to remind you of that. And we're actually seeing uh, this inability to, uh, you know, disagree agreeably 
Um, we're starting to see it even in uh, print media and, um, and we're seeing it just talking about in general society. So I think Ed, you had a, a slide and had read this article if I'm prompting that up. On learning to disagree and argue with others. Ed, I, I think you had pulled that oh, article. No. It, it, it's an interesting article that highlights the, the things that you're talking about, about okay. the, the, how, how to um, disagree without being disagreeable is basically how I would summarize it. it okay. it's, it's an interesting read. Yeah. And the reason that we just wanted to highlight it is that we're seeing this even, you know, in, in opinion sections of the New York Times of just that this is happening in our society. Um, and so then what can we do as practicing attorneys, as members of the judicial branch, as being officers of the court, what can we do to reemphasize? So it may feel like, oh, you know, okay, another lecture on civility. But again, I'd like to harken back to it's not unlike with our kids where we're hoping that maybe at least we plant the seed where maybe you'll think to yourself, how how was I civil to someone today? How was I how was I more courteous? How was I professional in my practice? So um, we contend, and my contention is uh, why civility is the right choice. And we have a slide that'll highlight that and we'll summarize that. Um, and there's just a couple points, and I'm sure this is not entirely comprehensive. Uh, and I'm sure you have your own reasons uh, and could think of them, but at least what we thought is civility is the right choice because one, it's a professional requirement, and we talked about that. Um, two, frankly, it's good for your client. Um, I can make the contention argument that saves time and money, generally less conflict over uh, discovery issues, uh, mediation issues, setting, scheduling, um, and it saves your client money and uh, it keeps you from being distracted on what the goal is. And the goal is to represent your client effectively and zealously. Um, the third point, making civility a fundamental part of your practice. Uh, my contention is that it's a strength. It's not a weakness. It's strength under control. When you are professional, when you are courteous, uh, you're demonstrating um, integrity, civility, a strength where you're not taking the bait. Maybe you're not gonna, you're not gonna go low when someone invites you to go low. Um, I'm a sports fan, so I have a tendency to use these uh, sports analogies, but I think we've admired before, uh, if you've ever been watching any athletic event and uh, one competitor takes a cheap shot at the other competitor, I don't care if it's basketball, soccer, football, whatever, and you see the, the other, the recipient of the cheap shot respond in a way where they don't try to strike back, they stay focused and they're trying to keep the objective on the game. They're trying to win the game. They're not trying to fight with the person against them who's trying to bait them into it. Um, as a mediator, frankly, I can tell you right off the bat when I have a mediation and the attorneys have a good working relationship, it's cordial, it's professional, they've picked up the phone, they talk to each other. It doesn't matter if they totally disagree with the other person's worldview or the other party's worldview. If they have a rapport and they're civil and they can communicate and they can agree to disagree, uh, it, it makes the mediation so much more successful. I mean, they just you can just feel them and they settle. It's easier to gain ground as opposed to, uh, I can't tell you when I get a mediation and you get someone who says, you know, I. I'm not giving more than X amount to that son of a gun. You know, they were terrible to my client and I hate that. And you just go, wow, personal uh, uh, animosity is getting in the way of representing your client and getting, getting your job done. Um, and then, you know, obviously I'm harping on the point, the last one, society in general is losing the ability to have respectful discussions in which folks may disagree about something. And we, 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 we know we're all experiencing it um, so how do we help combat this corrosive trend and help protect the importance and integrity of the court judicial system uh, and that and the judicial branch of government? And so it really becomes at least my first part would be it's a little bit like the question that I asked my kids and I hope for the attorneys out there. And it's a good reminder for me. I, I, no one is above this of maybe internalizing and asking that question. How was I professional today? How was I civil? How did I conduct myself? Or did I just did I just add to the coarseness, the breakdown of communication? We're losing this ability to have uh, discussions in which different viewpoints can be expressed 
but they don't have to become personal attacks. You can listen to each other. And frankly, being, being an attorney, that's what we're supposed to do. So uh, it may seem basic. I hope it's a reminder. I hope it's helpful. And again, civility is the right choice. Um, I, I'll hand it off to Carmen and Carmen's gonna talk about, we're, we're starting to see this course and this spill over into the courts. And I know that was Carmen's experience a great deal. But before we go to Carmen, if I could um, yes. Be yes, of course. And, and interrupt you, Chris, what do you do as a mediator when the lawyers before you are not behaving in a civil yeah. fashion? Yeah, thank you, Ed, for that question. Um, the, the first thing is, is the, the good news is I don't have a lot of experience with it, um, that the mediations now that may also be because we're on Zoom and maybe so there's not the if you're in person, there might be. If, if folks don't like each other, they might confront each other more, but I've still experienced it a little bit. And this is the stuff they don't teach you in law school. This I think has to do trying to understand what's what's pushing the buttons. Uh, why is someone acting uncivil? I've seen it a couple times with um, uh, clients that can't be controlled and counsel's got to get a hold of them because you'll have people who react and start to say almost, you know, I've, I've had a few insults come up. Well, how could they think that? And why would you tell me that? And you think, oh, I've got to, I've got to sometimes give you information that you need to listen to. Um, and in the, the one time that I can really recall where uh, someone was ag aggressively almost, um, they, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do alpha dog the whole way. And I'm almost going to be condescending and insulting and to everyone. There, there was a discussion of, you know, this doesn't further anything. And so I had a little chat offline, said, hey, can I talk to you on the other side? Didn't want to embarrass the attorney in front of their client. Uh, pulled them into a room and said, um, don't mistake my patience um, and my control for any sort of weakness. And you're really, you're really self-defeating right now. And if you would focus less on trying to score points and insult everyone and being uh, unprofessional, Maybe we can get your case settled and we can actually help your client and get back to the focus. And, and frankly, it kind of worked because I didn't I didn't scream at him. I just pointed it out of it's you, what are you doing? This is a really, really bad practice. Let's let's get back to trying to resolve the case. And it was almost, if you will, the sports analogy, the person who was just trying to pick a fight while you're playing basketball. And it's like, let's get back to playing basketball. Let's get back to the game. And and they seem to accept it. So that's yeah. the that's the best I can have it. And I think it comes down to uh, mediators having a sense of the room and being prepared and being people who practice civility to begin with. So they're ready for it. They're ready to confront it and not and not take the bait. So and I'm sure there are many other good answers. Ed, would you have any suggestion on that? Have you had an experience with that? I haven't had any experience with it in mediation, but I've obviously had my share of it in in private practice and during my years at Ticketmaster there were that there there was a little bit of that. But uh, I think your advice is is good and well taken. And that's that that's really the best the best approach. You don't want to get down in the gutter more than more than you need to. It doesn't serve you or your client very well. Yeah. You can you can be firm without being insulting. Is is sort of my little standard line. So um, I think we're going to Carmen's section now. Carmen, you're seeing it in the courts, correct? Yes. And actually, you know, what everything you you and Ed said is so true. Um, you you have to continue to be professional when you encounter people who are being uncivil. Um, um, and unfortunately, I think because of COVID, the COVID closures and the post COVID COVID environment now, where the courts still want people to appear remotely, it, that's an unfortunate an unfortunate side effect of that is that um, a lot of attorneys, especially the younger ones who are just coming into the practice, are not getting the experience of being in court. Um, I was a probate attorney for the Los Angeles Superior Court for almost thirty seven years. And um, as a probate attorney, uh, I had an opportunity to sit in the courtrooms, to uh, sit in on, on um, ordered mediations, um, and just you know, walking from my office to the courtroom to the clerk's office, uh, sitting in and watching 
you you have a valuable experience in a courtroom full of attorneys and their clients. It gives you the ability to observe not only the court and the court's demeanor and how the court deals with attorneys uh, and their clients, but also how the attorneys interact with other counsel, with the clerks, um, with the judge. Um, you learn uh, in a courtroom the etiquette, the courtroom etiquette, uh, and you observe and you learn from the experienced attorneys that treat people with dignity and respect who do, you know, in spite of the insults that are being uh, sent their way, they continue to advocate strongly for their clients without uh, getting into um, a, an argument. Um, the court, you know, everybody in the room, I, you know, sitting in the room, you know, just had so much respect for the attorney that could continue to advocate for their client in a civil um, manner. Uh, and it's something that a lot of young attorneys aren't getting a chance to see because of the fact that there's a lot of remote appearances that even when you show up in court in downtown LA, there's very few people in the courtroom. So um, unfortunately, you know, prior to COVID, you had this wonderful opportunity in the courtroom. And sometimes when you had inexperienced young attorneys show up and they were rude to opposing counsel, they were rude to the clerk. Sometimes they would interrupt the judge they couldn't get the hint that the judge was saying, hey, I've heard enough, you, you don't need to say anything further, but kept on talking. Um, you, 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 unfortunately, you don't see, you don't have that opportunity uh, anymore. And I think what's lost on some folks is the fact that you're not just an advocate for your client, you are an officer of the court. And I can't emphasize enough how important um, each of us are as we play a part in the judicial system, in the orderly administration of law. I, you know, I love my job. I love being in the court. I love the whole process because we were all part of making the administration of law a success, despite all the, you know, things that sometimes don't happen correctly. Sometimes there's delays and stuff. We have a judicial system that works that and we have dedicated people we have dedicated attorneys representing for their clients we have dedicated judges who spend hours and hours of time preparing for their cases every day we have you know um probate attorneys probate examiners clerks uh court reporters people that you know always go the extra mile to help make the system work and we all have to remember um from the judges to the attorneys to everybody involved in the legal process we are important in making that process work. And, and in order to be able to continue to have a wonderful legal process, we have to have civility. We have to, we, there is absolutely no reason why you can't advocate strongly for your client without getting into um, arguments. And, uh, you know, I've seen my share over the years of people in different courtrooms. Um, I, there were three attorneys lined up in front of a judge, two of them uh, on the sides were, were just, you know, being very rude and uncivil to the attorney in the center. And the judge, you know, uh, tried to get them to stop and finally got off the bench, went in cha chambers and gave him 15 minutes to cool off. And when he came back, they, they all apologized for their, it doesn't serve your client's purpose. It doesn't allow the court to move forward with their caseloads. They have heavy caseloads. Um, there's not enough time in the courtroom as it is to actually give each case the attention that the attorneys want for their cases. They're just, the courts in California are always understaffed. They have large caseloads. They have large trial caseloads coming up. Uh, you know, some of the courtrooms in LA County are setting trials two years into the future. They have a heavy workload. They, they don't need to spend extra time trying to have attorneys um, learn that you have to be civil. So um, part of also, you know, the, 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 side, the bad side effects of COVID on the court and court attendance is that you don't have, attorneys don't have the opportunity like they used to, to bring young attorneys to the courtroom with them. I used to see um, a lot of experienced attorneys come down the hall, I'd say hi to them. And, oh, I'd like to introduce you to my new associate. I'm bringing this associate here so that they can learn, um, you know, 
uh, what the court process is all about and how to make appearances. And, you know, that was an invaluable tool. Mentorship for the younger attorneys by the other uh, more experienced attorneys is um, something that unfortunately, I think there's less opportunity for that now. And um, and I, I would suggest uh, to the experienced attorneys that, um, you know, a part of doing this mentorship is that you because you love and respect our legal system and the practice of law, which is such an exciting and diverse practice. I mean, you have Ed who has a certain experience. You have Chris who has a certain experience. You have me. We all are in different aspects of the legal experience, but we love um, this practice of law and we want to you know, have it continue after we retire. And so I, 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 as you know, you're encouraged to do pro bono work. You know, I encourage you to mentor uh, a, a younger attorney, uh, help them, you know, learn the process and, and and help them to love the practice of law and that we are all guardians of that as officers of the court. We can advocate for our clients, but we can protect the system that allows us to advocate for their clients and help move the cases forward. And the other thing about communication, um, unfortunately, I think one of the aspects of social media has is the it, it, it sometimes allows people to be rude online without having any consequences for their behavior or to actually see the impact of how this affects somebody that you're criticizing online, sometimes, you know, way beyond, you know, um, the bounds of courtesy. Um, and sometimes that filters into the emails and the text communications. Um, and, you know, you need to think about, you know, what when you're sending these things, you know, how, how it may sound, even when you don't intend to be rude. I remember getting a, 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 a little um, tutorial when we started having emails, you know, because I've been around a long time before we even had computers. You know, we used to write our probate notes on large pieces of paper. And when we got computers and we started getting emails, you know, somebody said, now you have to be really careful because sometimes, you know, even when you don't mean to be rude, people might see the way you're saying it as being rude. So I always preface, you know, every time I sent an email, I said, I, I responded to an email, I would say, thank you so much for sending me this email. And I'm happy to help you with, you know, and then I would go in and explain, you know, whatever it was that they wanted an explanation for. But I sometimes like went overboard in courtesy, because I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't taken as being rude. But, um, but sometimes people intentionally mean to be rude. And, and, and there's just no reason for it. You, you, don't, you don't serve your clients by being rude. You know, you you need to have a civility and camaraderie in the legal profession, because like I said, we all have a vested interest in making it uh, a workable system where we can move our cases, we can advocate for our client, um, we can help the, the court with their caseloads by resolving these things. And um, so I think we, as, as, uh, as Chris was doing with his kids, you know, I think each day we should, you know, say, you know, how are we civil? Uh, you know, I know you you were talking to your kids about what we we do for others, but in civility too, if if there is a, a something that you can do for opposing counsel that doesn't cost your client anything, you're not disclosing anything, but you know, if somebody needs a courtesy copy, you know, it, it, you know, courtesy and and extending yourself goes a long way, um, and. You just need to keep that in mind. Um, I don't think we can lose a civility unless we let it, you know? So I think we all need to try to, um, if we see a young attorney, you know, just maybe put take him aside and say, you know, you might want to think about this, uh, uh, you know, just your own actions. I think it will go a long way. And I give it back to Chris. Well, thank you. That was, that was great. I think, uh, Ed, this is the section on the snitch rule. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Carmen. So we now have new reporting requirements in California as of August 1st, 2023, after a lot of consideration, public comments, and revisions. We now have Rule 8.3, which requires lawyers to inform the state bar or other tribunal of another lawyer's criminal act or other misconduct. In this segment, um, I will review the rule uh, what it covers, when and to whom 
uh, reporting is required, uh, some important exceptions, what happens when a complaint is made, whether it's confidential, and uh, what it might mean for the mediation process. Um, before we um, delve into the different aspects of the rule, I just want to make a few preliminary comments. Um, first, the um, the rule was uh, was revised a few times by the by the Supreme Court, and it was uh, it was somewhat controversial um, during the uh, the time it was being considered. It may be controversial now. There was a survey that fifty one percent of the lawyers surveyed opposed the rule. Uh, we are the last state in the country to adopt some version of ABA model rule 8.3, which this is based on. And uh, we don't really have time for it in the 20 minutes or so that I'm, I'm going to speak about the rule, but there are about, well, not about, there are 10 comments that the Supreme Court made to the rule that are uh, that are listed below the rule when, when you look it up that, um, that you might take a look at that helped to explain and contextualize the rule. I'm going to try to highlight a few of those comments um, that explain some aspects of the rule. Um, let's uh, go to the next slide, if we can. So basically, the summary of the, of the rule, in short, requires attorneys under appropriate circumstances to report certain criminal or dishonest conduct or misappropriation of funds by other attorneys to the state bar. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and so it requires informing the state bar or a tribunal with jurisdiction to investigate or act on this conduct. So the, the lawyers on this uh, on this Zoom have come to a uh, dispute resolution company for their uh, for their ethics uh, segment. So what does this mean for uh, arbitration and mediation? Well, in the comments to the rule, making it making a uh, a report to a private arbitrator is probably uh, not sufficient. Although reporting misconduct of this type to uh, to an arbitrator would require uh, or would trigger a reporting obligation of the of the lawyer to whom it's made the the, the arbitrator. Um, when is it required? Um, it's when it's it's required, uh, reporting is required when there's credible evidence that another lawyer has committed a criminal act uh, or uh, uh, has engaged in conduct involving dis dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or reckless or intentional misrepresentation or misappropriation of funds or property. And the um, conduct rises to the level that is, uh, it creates a substantial question as to the lawyer's honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness in other respects. Um, also um, of importance is, you know, when exactly does the report need to be made? Uh, in the first line of the rule, it speaks of without undue delay, and undue delay in the uh, comment three to the rule is defined as um, Undue delay requires the lawyer to report as soon as the lawyer reasonably believes the reporting will not cause material prejudice or damage to the interests of a client or the lawyer or a client of the lawyer's firm. So basically what I think that means is unless there's some material prejudice or damage that would arise, you need to make this report pretty much right away. Um, next slide, please. Are there exceptions? Uh, there are several. Uh, the, the first one um, is information protected by the uh, by the rules governing mediation confidentiality. So uh, we will discuss those confidentiality rules in the next segment. But um, just noting noting them for now. Let's go to the next slide, please. Also, the information protected from the from disclosure by the attorney client privilege. Um, reporting is not required in, in that instance. Um, ne next slide, please. Um, so th this just is more more uh, language, uh, making it clear that the attorney-client privilege is not uh, undermined by this new reporting requirement. And then uh, there are a number of other exceptions. Uh, there are applicable privileges and then also information 
that is disclosed or uh, is comes about uh, as a result of a lawyer uh, seeking mental health uh, treatment or or assistance. Uh, that that's meant obviously to uh, continue to encourage lawyers to seek mental health assistance when they when they need it. And also, it does not um, require the disclosure of of confidential what would otherwise be uh, considered confidential information under the uh, Business and Professions Code. Next slide, please. So um, are the reports to the State Bar confidential? It's not explicitly listed in the, in the text of the rule, but there are rules governing the confidentiality of reports to the State Bar. And there, um, you go to the next slide, please. There is a, an FAQ currently on the State Bar website uh, that reiterates that uh, reports to the state bar are confidential. However, once the, the state bar uh, acts on the complaint and files a, uh, a, a charge against a lawyer, it will it will become public. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the good news for those that are worried about being falsely reported to the state bar are there are penalties for making false reports to the state bar. Uh, or other tribunal. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, it, and then one question that a lot of people have is, is this reporting requirement retroactive? The, the rule went into effect August 1st, 2023. Uh, that is, uh, the rule is silent as to re retroactivity. So I don't know what to tell you about that. I mean, I could uh, argue it both ways. I think um, it, it probably is not retroactive, but I don't want to get myself in trouble with the state bar or speak for them because in all honesty, I do not know. But that is an issue to uh, to consider. Okay, so for the mediation uh, process, um, there are uh, penalties for malicious reports. So those that are concerned about uh, an adversary, you know, harking back to uh, Chris and Carmen's segment on on uh, on civility. If someone is just going to wing in a, a report to the state bar uh, in, a, in a punitive way, there there are penalties for doing so. And also, uh, it's clear from the comments to the rule and uh, and and generally that there are still rules um, that uh, prohibit threatening criminal, administrative, or disciplinary action to gain a uh, an unfair advantage in a civil setting against a, a, um, a lawyer. And um, so there, there is that protection. Uh, how does it impact civility? Um, I, I, again, I could argue that both ways. I would be curious what, uh, what our experts on civility might have to say about that, either Chris or Carmen, if you have a, a take on whether there's uh, something about civility that uh, could be uh, implicated by this new reporting requirement. I don't. Chris? I'll, yeah, I'll I'll start. Ed, I I don't think so. I think it just it supplements and goes along with civility being re required. Is it, it, civility doesn't go away? So maybe there's a nuance that I'm missing in that. I, I think I think where the question uh, comes from is I have read some things, uh, including uh, an article in the Daily Journal when the when the rule first went into effect, where there was a speculation by some lawyers that the rule could lead to vindictive litigation games. But I agree. I agree. I think that uh, I, I don't I don't see that um, when, it, when you come right down to it. And I think, uh, as mentioned, there are a number of, of, of protections uh, against making um, improper reports, including uh, penalties for making false statements and the continuing rules against uh, uh, and laws against extortion and uh, and threatening disciplinary action to gain a, an unfair advantage. Yeah. And um, for as hardball as uh, civil litigation can be in California, uh, in the area uh, that I handle and, and, and practiced in and now handle as a mediator, I haven't seen this creep into the mediations. I can say that, uh, at least that's my experience. I haven't seen what I suspect to be a malicious report, bad conduct people. They're, they're, they're there to try and mediate. They may disagree. You may have some bad actors, but I haven't seen it. 
uh, rise to the level of really bad actors, you know, intentionally trying to use the process uh, to punish people. Or, mm -hmm. uh, so I just have an, I don't have any experience with it. Carmen, do you have anything to add? Well, yeah, I do. You know, um, I, in my observation, my 37 years uh, at, at the court, um, you know, what I've observed is that most attorneys um, that I've come into contact with are professional. Um, they they love the practice. Um, I, I, I just don't see that many people. Uh, doing this, you know, filing malicious reports. I just don't see it. I, you know, it, you know, you have to think long and hard. You, you would be, you know, ruining somebody's reputation. Um, it, it, it's a very serious thing, and I think anybody who would want to file a report would would uh, would look at it um, soberly and seriously, and and um, you know, only do it if um, if you know it fits within the the letter of that of that that requirement i just i don't see a lot of people filing malicious reports it's good okay and the the final point is that uh, as noted before mediation confidentiality still applies and so with that maybe that is the cue to go on to the next segment on mediation confidentiality okay that's my my section and um uh, as I've already indicated, uh, you know, I was a probate attorney um, for LA Superior Court for almost 37 years. And during that time, I worked in different courthouses and saw the hustle and bustle of daily business in court, crowded hallways full of attorneys and their clients moving from courtroom to courtroom to conduct their business. It was kind of exciting, actually, you know, especially in downtown LA. Those courtrooms in the morning were just packed full of people. And, um, one interesting aspect of it, as I used to go from my courtroom to my office, uh, was um, these informal conferences that I would see periodically. Uh, attorneys would sit down on those really hard, cold marble uh, benches um, in the hallway, trying to resolve their cases before um, the calendar matter was called, or sometimes they would just run into another attorney that they had a case with, and they, they, they had a few minutes during the court recess and sit down and try to resolve their 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 on their coming um, their case that was coming up, and if it was a case that that they were both there for that morning, you know, sometimes their clients would be in the hallway as well, and uh, sometimes like I would observe the attorneys sh shuttling back and forth between the opposing counsel and their clients, whispering, uh, uh, chatting for a little bit, and sometimes they would actually settle their cases in the hallway. Or at the very least, sometimes they would narrow the issues that the judge had to decide. Um, and it was just it was just a really interesting um, learning experience for me watching all that going on. Um, and I marveled at, you know, the, the practice of law in the hallway. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate because of COVID and the post-COVID um, uh, way of doing things in the court, um, those days of crowded courtrooms and early resolutions uh, in the hallway are appear to be a thing of the past. And so, you know, it was kind of, you know, I would have to say more of an like an informal, impromptu way of mediating and resolving your case without actually having a mediator there with you. Um, but, you know, since we don't have that, and that was an avenue that a lot of attorneys use, I think if we could actually garner some statistics about how many cases were settled in the hallways in different courthouses, we'd all be surprised at how many were settled that way. Um, but, but we don't have that. So we need we need something else. And I think mediation is is so important. I'm, I'm a strong advocate of mediation because I have seen what it can do. Um, it can give uh, an early resolution of cases that may have a trial date two years into the future. It can, um, like I had one, one uh, instance, I was talking to a, a realtor involved in a probate case about sometime last year. The dispute between um, the parties was going into its second year in this decedent's estate. In the meantime, the house that needed to be distributed was still sitting in the probate and nobody was living in it. And during that two year period, somebody moved into the house, a squatter, and it took them almost a year and a half to get that person out of the house. 
So you've got an asset sitting there while people are trying to, you know, uh, go back and forth on this litigated matter that could have gone to mediation early on, gotten resolved. They could have, you know, done their final account, made their final distribution and not have that problem creep up because of the delay in getting that estate closed. So mediation is extremely important. Um, you can get matters uh, resolved earlier and um, you can get... Um, you can get, you save time, you save money, you save the emotional stress, you save the assets sometimes by being able to distribute them earlier. Um, and in order to have a mediation process, you have to have confidentiality. Confidentiality, as you see on the slide here, number 25, is important because the rules of evidence and the case law require it, the parties rely on it, and it promotes settlement of cases. Um, next slide, please. So there are statutes and case law um, concerning confidentiality. Next slide. Um, you see there's a federal rule of evidence, rule 408. Um, and then I think the one, the rules that I think most affect people, um, um, California evidence, uh, there's California evidence code rules that I think people uh, are going to be more interested in. And the most important, I think, and I put it at the very top, is um, section 1119C that says all communications, negotiation, and settlement discussions um, by the participants is confidential. And um, let's see. I'm sorry, I couldn't, um, part of my slides covered up. Um, section 1119C says all communications, negotiations, or settlement discussions by and between participants in the course of a mediation or a mediation consultation shall remain confidential. And, and this means all, all means all. Um, and the rule applies to everybody. It applies to the mediators, the parties, and the attorneys. Um, this policy is designed to encourage people to share information. It's, it's, it's kind of analogous to the attorney-client privilege. Uh, your client comes to see you and, you know, you need to have the facts of the case in order to adequately re represent the client, but they don't want to tell you some stuff that is kind of, um, it doesn't show them in the best light. And you say, well, you know, you can tell me because we have an attorney client privilege, you know, and I can't disclose this information. Um, and so, and, and, you know, because we have this attorney client privilege, attorneys, you know, guard it, you know, it's like a sacred oath. Well, you know, confidentially in mediation fosters, me, uh, you know, resolution of issues. We all have to treat it um, as sacrosanct and, and not disclose information. It's, it's because the policy is designed to encourage people to share their information and compromise so they can resolve their cases. They don't want to have to be worried about what they said in, in, in mediation to come back at them later on if, if the case doesn't get resolved. So, so it's really important um, that this um, be respected. Next slide, please. And uh, it's not just the case, the, the, the statute, but look at this case here. This is the Cassell versus Superior Court. Um, Mr. Cassell, he had a, a he went to a mediation and um, he afterwards sued his attorneys for malpractice. And um, the trial court said, you know, because he was trying in the malpractice action to admit the communications that he had with his attorney. Um, and the, the Superior Court said, you can't disclose that. It went to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals said, yeah, you can. And um, then it went to the Supreme Court that said the following, that all, and basically recited um, uh, uh, evidence code 1119C, that all communications, negotiations, or settlement discussion by between the parties in the course of a mediation or mediation consultation shall remain confidential. And it said here that we have repeatedly said that, that these provisions are clear and absolute, except in rare cir circumstances, this should be strictly applied. Now, um, there was a dissent that that actually agreed with the majority, but said, you know, you know, basically, you know, this is kind of a, a, of a, a shame in this situation because the attorneys who, uh, you know, uh, are being sued for malpractice are not uh, getting um, uh, the, the client who's suing the, the attorneys for malpractice. They're not getting 
he's not getting the opportunity to disclose these communications. And, and I think basically what the court said that maybe this is something that the legislature needs to look at with regard to this. So um, what happened uh, a few years later is if you'll see at the bottom of the slide that in, in 2018, what um, was passed was a revision to uh, evidence code 1122 and added 1128. And that 1128 requires um, attorneys before let's go to a mediation um, to inform their their clients um, about the fact that you know um, a mediation is confidential, and um, it also required the attorneys um, to um, provide um, the clients with a form that they need to sign, and the language of that is in the code section. Um, which basically informs the clients part of the mediation that um, the discussions, um, the you know the, all the different aspects uh, uh, that are recited in 1129 um, are confidential and can't be disclosed. And I think uh, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on this because I I think attorneys who are used to the legal process and used to going to mediations. Um, need to like step back and think. Um, your clients are new to the legal process. Um, they um, don't even sometimes know what mediation means. What does that word mean? Um, I believe that not only when you you know you're now required to spend some time explaining the confidentiality rules to your client, you need to explain. I think the whole process of mediation. Um, and what you know, what what it, why it's designed the way it is. It's designed to help people resolve their issues, um, and and in order to be able to resolve your issues, these these um, communications need to be kept confidential. You need to tell your client that that means you can't tell anybody, and certainly you can't put it on social media. You don't put it on your Facebook. What happened in mediation? Um, I was talking to an attorney I know yesterday about a case. Um, he told me that there was some kind of a confidential um, memo um, in, a, in this case. It had nothing to do with mediation, but he found out his his client put it on 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 a social media page, something that was confidential. So he, I I think people need to spend some time talking to their clients about um, the confidential aspect of it. This is a good avenue to resolve issues. Uh, and I wanna spend some time indicating because I worked for the court for many years. Um, all the years I worked at the court and now because I still have contact with folks at the court and kind of find out how things are going. Historically and even today, the courts are understaffed. They have high volume of cases. Um, they have large trial calendars um, that unfortunately sometimes have to be set way into the future. Um, if every case that went to mediation went to trial instead, um, I'm not sure how the court would be able to handle that kind of a caseload. And I, I'm sure you're all aware of the budget problems that the, the state has. And um, the, the, court, the, the state is already talking about budget cuts to different state um, agencies. Um, I haven't heard anything about the court yet, but um, if the budget problems continue, um, there might be some cuts to the court or, or already understaffed and underfunded court system. Um, so you want to protect the mediation process and the way to do that is to make sure that the confidential you know, is, um, is respected and the rules are followed. Next slide, please. Now, there are exceptions, um, and uh, I've set them forth in the next two slides, the exceptions, um, which um, are, as, if the, the, as I said right here, all, all, all persons who conduct or otherwise participate in the mediation expressly agree in writing. So you can agree in writing to disclose the information. Um, the, the communication document or writing was prepared by or on behalf of fewer than all the uh, participants, and those Participants expressly agree in writing or orally uh, in, in uh, accordance with section 1118. Um, and it doesn't disclose anything said or done um, may, uh, that was done in the course of the mediation. Um, and um, the communication document is related to attorney's compliance with the requirements described in 1129. 
Um, that's why, you know, you really, you, it's not only important, you know, this uh, new section 1129, not only so that your clients are aware of the confidentiality requirements, but, you know, there are, there are penalties um, for the attorney if you don't uh, make sure that you comply with that. Now, um, I don't know how many people, because we don't have statistics, but um, I've heard that sometimes, uh, you know, from somebody who seems to be in the know, and I don't have any, you know, any basis other than the, the comment that was made to me, is that some attorneys are forgetting to have their clients sign that disclosure, um, that acknowledgement agreement that's required in 1129. So please, please, please uh, make sure that you do that, that you talk to your client. Um, and um, it doesn't hurt also to talk to your client about the civility uh, uh, as you know the way they, they should conduct themselves in mediation. Okay, next slide. And um, I, I'm gonna not. I'm not gonna read the, this code because unfortunately the pictures of us on the screen is cutting off. That's why I'm having a little trouble reading these um, these slides. It cuts off part of the words. But you can see that there are ex statutory exceptions um, with regard to settlement agreements. And uh, I'm gonna let you read them yourself. So hopefully um, our pictures are not um, blocking that for you. Um, next slide. Um, Okay, here we go. This th this is actually in Evidence Code 1125, um, which indicates when a mediation is over. So, um, you know, as long as you're talking, uh, you know, like during the mediation and you're doing things in the mediation process, um, these things are confidential. So like, if you look at here, the first one, agreement, when there's an executed written agreement or an oral agreement that is reached in accordance with Evidence Code 1118, then the mediation is over. Uh, it's over 10 days with no communication between the mediator and any of the other parties. So if you have mediation that didn't settle the day that you were in mediation, but you still wanna have you know, discussions that maybe um, you, know, you can resolve it um, after the mediation, you just need to keep track of the days um, uh, and you know, keep communicating so that um, you don't go beyond that 10 days. Um, and then termination, when the mediator or a party provides in writing that the mediation is terminated consistent with 1121. Next slide. Um, I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this in California, but there is a, a uniform law commission in the United States and um, there's a uniform mediation act, which has been adopted by 13 jurisdictions. So it's 12 states and the District of Columbia. And it established um, a confidentiality privilege for mediators and um, the participants that prohibits what is said during mediation from being used in a later proceeding. California has not adopted this. Um, next slide, as you can see by the map. Um, and I, I put here some of the exceptions in the act um, with regard to confidentiality, which, um, you can take a look at. Uh, I would suggest if you're interested in this um, that you um, go to the uniform, um, their website. Um, you can Google um, the commission or just Google the act, Mediation Act, and you can pull it up and, and, and take a look at it. Um, next slide. Now, this is a, a, a bill that was um, that that was introduced last year. I'm not. I don't know if many attorneys are aware of this, but there's a currently it's tabled right now. But this bill was introduced in uh, 2023. 20, I think it was in February. Um, and it's kind of it's rather uh, concerning. I think to a lot of people who uh, really um, feel that the mediation process uh, is 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 helpful, not only to the parties but to the court system. Um, this bill uh, would require um, a dispute resolution neutral, including a mediator and arbitrator, as well as the alternative dispute resolution provider to report to the state bar um, the receipt of any complaint that the dispute resolution neutral violated a provision of any applicable rule of conduct as provided in the ABA's model standards of conduct for mediators, family mediation standards, code of ethics for commercial arbitrators, or judicial counsel ethic rules. Now the concerns is that um, you know some people have um, real concerns. I do 
um, that um, that this may have a very negative impact on um, the mediation process. Um, and there were a lot of public, um, I think, comments on it, and it was tabled. Um, and so I don't think it's up yet. Uh, I don't know if they're going to reintroduce it this year, but they do have, uh, I think, until the end of the year to reintroduce it. I, I'm not sure about the, the time timeline for introdu reintroducing it. But I think it should be a concern to everybody that has um, been able to use the mediation process to resolve cases. Um, and, you know, there are already ways um, to report any suspected misconduct to the state bar. Um, and some of the provisions in this bill are ambiguous. Um, I think uh, perhaps onerous in its reporting requirements and ambiguous is what to do with some of it. Um, so I wondered if Chris and Ed have any comments about this assembly bill, 924. Chris? Didn't know if Ed, Ed, you're on mute. Um, nothing nothing new to add other than the concerns that are listed on your on your slide of it's there's already protection for it yeah I, I think i think it's concerning for the reasons that you mentioned the sponsor of the bill i believe is assembly person jesse gabriel from the west san fernando valley um and he's the one that was pushing it I, I think there was some some opposition from from members of the bar and the the neutral community that caused it to be tabled. I, I don't know the specifics, but if anyone is interested in um, opposing it, it would be, you know, wouldn't be a bad idea to let assembly person uh, Gabriel and other assembly members and state senators know about it. And I, I, I if, if it impacts um, mediation severely, it, it, I, I think it would be very difficult for the court system. Um, to be able to handle the, the caseload um, that would uh, incur this it would would happen if uh, if people you know um, were not being able to do mediation. So I just food for thought and something to keep an eye out for. Yep. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so here's um, my takeaways, um, the summary of what um, I was talking about. Uh, remember that all the co communications, negotiations, and settlement discussions by and between participants in the course of the mediation or a mediation consultation shall remain confidential. I, I can't stress it enough, confidentiality. Um, and, you know, like I said, we all have a vested interest in, in, in making sure the mediation process works because it promotes settlement of cases, it reduces the caseload, um, it saves time, it saves emotional uh, stress, on your clients, um, it it helps the the caseload for the court. Um, it's it's a it's a good alternative to waiting two years for a trial. Um, and you know one of the one of the benefits I think of mediation that that you know the court doesn't have time for is to allow each of the parties you know to kind of just say their piece, to get things off their chest at the beginning of the process. Um, unfortunately, the court doesn't have time, you know, to allow, you know, people to spend 15, 20 minutes, you know, uh, 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 telling their side of the story. Um, there's just not enough time in, in the court's calendar to do that. Um, so it, it promotes uh, it promotes resolution is the most important thing. Make sure you're if you have information you want to disclose to the mediator during your talk with the mediator, uh, uh, indicate to the mediator whether you want that information shared or you don't want it shared. Um, and so the, the, the mediator will respect your request. Uh, remember that there is that new evidence code section. Uh, actually, it's been around for five years now that requires attorneys to get written acknowledgement from their clients prior to the mediation so that they understand that um, the, the communications are confidential and inadmissible at trial. Um, and then at that same time, talk to them about civility, talk to them about, about you know, the whole process that it's it's geared to resolve issues. Um, discuss with your client the importance of keeping information confidential and not posting it on social media. All right. And I think that summarizes it all. Um, back to you. Okay. So this is the segment on diligence and competence. Uh, we all 
know generally that we're supposed to be diligent and prompt and timely. As lawyers, we're kind of in the diligence business. We all know we need to meet deadlines and we kind of live and die by those deadlines. But um, this part of the of the presentation, uh, we are going to review a few specific rules about diligence and uh, the rules against prohibiting uh, the, the rules prohibiting undue delay and uh, and, and competence requirements. Um, so we're going to go through those. We're going to go through a few examples of ways in which those rules could possibly be violated. And then we're also going to talk a bit about what these um, what these rules mean for the mediation process. So let's go to the first slide. There, there, there are a couple uh, short rules. I'll, I'll just read them. Uh, won't take long. A lawyer shall act with reasonable diligence and promptness in representing a client. Next. And then rule of court 1.3a, a lawyer shall not intentionally, repeatedly, recklessly, or within or with gross negligence fail to act with reasonable diligence in representing a client. So next slide, please. So what does it mean to be diligent and prompt? And more particularly, what does that mean in mediation? Uh, are you prepared for mediation? What, what does it mean to be prepared for mediation? How prepared do you need to be? Uh, what does it mean to misuse mediation? And also we're gonna uh, touch upon uh, when practicing outside one's area of expertise or in an unfamiliar area of the law is possibly a violation of the rules um, requiring diligence. Next, please. So um, 1.3b provides reasonable diligence means that a lawyer acts with a commitment and dedication to the interests of the client and does not neglect or disregard or unduly delay a legal matter entrusted to the lawyer. So what is that? Next slide, please. Um, so let's get down to some uh, some specifics about mediation and, and some examples, and maybe my colleagues can uh, weigh in here a bit. So how much time before mediation should a lawyer uh, file a brief or a mediation statement? I, I, the, the, medi the mediators, will tell you how long or how much in advance they want a statement to be filed. Um, I will read them up until the last minute. Uh, I ask for them five days in advance, but oftentimes they come in you know, much closer to the start time of the mediation. Really what you want to be able to do as the, the lawyer in a mediation is you want to just provide the, the mediator with the tools to help you to best serve your client. And it's not a hard and fast rule, but you wanna make sure that you're not just winging it. Um, I, I've been in mediations over the last few months where I don't get anything um, at all, or um, those are mostly the volunteer cases that I do, or they come in kind of late. Um, you know, Chris and Carmen, what do, you, what do you think about that? What's your practice and what do you think about being late with um, mediation statements? Carmen, would you like to go first? You're on mute, uh, or do you want me to answer? Okay, I'm on. I'm I'm here. Sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, we uh, require we ask uh, the the parties to submit the mediation briefs five days before the mediation. Um, we don't always get them. Um, sometimes we get them like the afternoon, the day before. Um, I don't think that's helpful. Um, it's it's really helpful if you could get it to us um, at least a couple of days before. I mean, we asked for five days, and it 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 benefits everybody if we get those um, at least five days before because it gives us an opportunity to review the matter, to think about it, um, to uh, with Judge Carla and I to discuss it prior to the um, the probate co mediation that we do. Um, and uh, it helps your client because you you want to give as much information to the mediator as possible um, and time to absorb it. Um, Chris, what do you think? 
I have a, a request on a five day rule as well. I, you know, as we're all acknowledging, there's a practical implication of practicing uh, law in California. And I know uh, for folks who do the civil litigation, sometimes uh, you're getting last minute information. Maybe you're getting a report from a doctor, you're waiting on some key information. So I can certainly understand um, and have a grace period. You know, if I can get a mediation brief three days before, I ask for five, if I can get it three days before, it's great. And if I get it the day before or the morning of, makes it tougher. Uh, it's not something that's insurmountable, but um, it it puts a strain on the mediator and you want, uh, you know, for the purposes of the mediator, uh, having a good understanding of two, three, if there's four sides of being able to comprehend that information. Um, I guess I would say is that if you are filing or sending your brief a little bit on the late side, um, maybe try to practice brevity, you know, the, the ones that you get in the morning of, and this is rare, but it'll happen the, the morning of it's a 35 page brief and it's got, you know, 75 pages of medical records or something that, or some memos that they want you to reference. And you think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it and I can get it done, but you're just putting a tougher strain on it. So I, I look at the, again, the more prepared folks are, the better the mediation seems to go. You can almost, at least in my experience, I can see a connection between them. Yeah, you're, you want to enable the mediator to help you as much as possible. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll read anything at any time. Uh, you know, I'm there to, there to serve. Uh, I'm not the, the judge in the case. I'm not the decision maker in, the, in a mediation, but it helps me to be more useful if I can get it in advance and digest it and think about it and, and ask questions beforehand so that when we start the mediation, we're ready to, to make some progress and, and be productive. So the, the next um, example or the next category, I guess, is knowledge of the facts. Showing up at a mediation without really being conversant with the facts, again, if you, you're you not arguing the case to the judge or the jury, but if you don't show up with uh, enough familiarity of the facts, at least the, the, the critical facts of the case, you're not doing your client uh, a service and you're, you're hindering your ability to enable the mediator to uh, be as helpful as possible. Um, do either one of you have any? Uh, well, I, I, I agree with that. that. I, I agree with you, Ed. Um, and I, sometimes people look at mediation as, well, it's just one 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 thing we have to do before we go to trial. I don't think you should look at it that way. I, I think you should like, you know, prepare for this mediation. Like, uh, you know, I don't say ex spend an inordinate amount of time because attorneys have practices, they're busy, but I agree, you need to know the facts, but, you know, try to be prepared so that, um, and, you know, submit the mediation briefs sooner rather than later, so that we have some time to look at it and we know the facts as well. Um, you know, you, you should look at the mediation process as, hey, we're gonna get this resolved and we're not gonna have to have a trial, you know? And so be, and be as prepared as you can possibly be given your time constraints, know the facts. And um, and if you look at the, at the mediation, not as, an un, you know, I have to go to mediation, but hey, this could resolve everything, mediation. Let, let's give the mediator all the facts. Um, I think you'd go a long way. So one concrete example, you know, confidentially and uh, or respecting confidenti confidentiality and anonymously that I can provide is I had a patent mediation where... Uh, it turned on what the uh, what the sales figures were, and what the and therefore what the the royalties potentially owed might be, and that critical information wasn't produced until midway through the uh, through the mediation. The, the case ultimately got settled, but it, it made it more complicated, cumbersome, and difficult uh, to do. And if that had been uh, per, and the the lawyer that provided it wasn't uh, was learning some of that information on the fly as was I and was the uh, the other side. So it was uh, it just made for uh, a more difficult experience. So, hey, Ed, I would I would like to comment on if and I think we're talking maybe a little bit about number two 
right now, but I might leak over to number four unless you want me to, to hold off. Because what I would say on number two is not only knowledge of the facts as the attorney showing up, but I, I, at least in the cases that I mediate, uh, I can't tell you it can come down an important part of the settlement posture is, gee, the, the plaintiff was great in depot. The plaintiff was re oh, really struggled, wasn't, wasn't a very good witness. The defendant's PMQ was wonderful. The PMQ didn't know anything and was a disaster. And if you get an attorney who shows up and is maybe familiar with the depot and maybe read the black and white uh, transcript, but has no idea how it went, no feel for it, is a jury going to like them? How's that going to go? The strength weaknesses. So it's it's a little bit beyond the facts, but it's still a part of the case that frankly can be so important in the cases that I mediate. And so if I if I have attorneys that aren't familiar with how the witnesses did, how, how are they going to come across to a jury? It it really impacts mediation it, and it holds it back, frankly. Yeah. I, thanks, Chris. I, I wasn't bleeding over into uh, number four that's okay. more of a leap but uh, yeah. thank you for that it's more of yeah. a, a a legal matter where the, the attorneys or one or the other shows up without having figured out or thought through in advance what the measure of damages is not yeah. what they are but what measure of damages yeah. is going to be applied and uh, if, if you show up with without a clear idea uh in some cases of what that is you're uh it's not helpful to the mediator, but more importantly, it's not helpful to the interests of the client in, in getting a uh, having the best possible opportunity to, to settle the case um, in, in a um, in a favorable manner. So uh, going jumping around here, going back to number three, uh, how much time and expense should you go to in preparing a, a mediation brief or preparing for mediation? I, mean, I think the obvious answer um generally is it depends on the case, how complex it is, how uh, how much at stake there might be. You're, you're not going to put 35 hours into a $4,000 dispute. Uh, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be doing the, the client uh, a, a, any favors, and you probably wouldn't even get paid for it. Um, but you do need to um, make sure that you're putting the appropriate amount of time and effort into your mediation brief and preparation before you show up. Uh, do either of you want to make a comment about that, perhaps? I have, I have nothing to add. I think it's right for me. I agree. Okay. Um, so the the final point is, and this all is kind of a catch all for the for the other points. I mean, how per, uh, persuasive are you able or prepared to be at the mediation? This is, uh, you know, it's not. The whole case, but you know, it could be uh, an inflection point, or it could be your client's best opportunity to get out from under something, or to get a um, a, a good uh, a good settlement. And you want to maximize the uh, the opportunity on behalf of your client. You want to do your, the best job that you can for your client to uh, enable the mediator to do what she or he uh, is 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 able to do for you, and to be. In order to do that, you need to be properly prepared. Okay. Uh, unless there's anything further on this, let's go to the next. Ed, could I could I go to number four just for one second? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, on the calculation of damages, just discussing damages. Um, and again, my my uh, my practice is um, not only that they have the the damages calculated and listed out, and it can be med records and loss of earnings kind of stuff the liens, but it's really helpful when both sides have uh, recent in the last, you know, year, two years, three years to support their view of the world, because how many times have, uh, am I in a mediation where, where in the world are they getting that from? And then I have a party that produces some verdicts that really support that position. Um, and you see it and you say, listen, they're, they're giving verdicts and showing or what this jurisdiction uh, does and has a basis for it. And I think that can be very persuasive uh, for everyone. The, not, I mean, it's persuasive to me just as the mediator of thinking, well, I'm going to go communicate that to the other side. And boy, you have to absorb this. And you think this is a ridiculously high demand or you think it's a ridiculously low demand. But let me show you their last four trials. Let me show you this jurisdiction. Let me show you 
uh, what the trend is. And it's really very helpful. So it's not a calculation of damages per se, but it's supporting the basis for your damages. So I just wanted to add that. Ed, you're on mute. I don't know how that happened. Okay, yeah. uh, maybe yeah. we'll discuss that in the technology section, my yeah. lack of proficiency <laughs> with the mute button. Okay, next slide. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Okay, uh, all of this is basically to say that not being properly prepared possibly could be a violation of the rules of professional conduct. I don't think we need to belabor it. Um, we, we, we all know that, it's pretty straightforward. Let's go to the next slide. Also, there is a rule of professional conduct against using um, uh, the mediation process for delay or to prolong the proceeding or make it more uh, expensive than it needs to be. Um, how that manifests itself, I suppose, is agreeing to go to a mediation or suggesting a mediation without any... Um, without any true desire or intention to try to settle the case. I mean, you, you, you're not required to settle when you go to a mediation. Oftentimes you, you go hoping to get a, a, a low or high settlement, uh, depending on which side of the case you're on. But um, you re you're not supposed to, to go there just for the purpose of delaying or running up the, uh, the expense to the other side. Next slide, please. So in addition to complying with the, the rules of professional conduct, you want to make sure on behalf of your client that you are, or clients, that you are using the mediation process to its fullest. You are, um, if you go to a, a mediation uh, and you're not fully prepared or properly prepared, you are wasting your client's time and money uh, you're also perhaps squandering an opportunity, maybe their only opportunity, maybe their best opportunity to get a good or a satisfactory settlement. And um, you know, there are times in a case where the case is ripe to be settled. You know, there's a picture of a duck there. That's just sort of a reminder that, you know, you want to be able to be in a position to feed the ducks while they're quacking. Uh, you might not get another opportunity to do so. So you want to be as prepared as you can be or as you need to be to take advantage of those opportunities. And the final point that I would make is, and, and this covers everything that we've been talking about, is uh, as, as lawyers, we are uh, in, in business and in practice, ultimately to serve the interests of our clients. And um, the things that we're talking about are the way to best serve the interests of your client, to be, to be prepared, to be ready to, to uh, get the best result possible for your client in mediation and do what you need to do within the ambit of that case to make sure that you're ready to, um, to do it and to perform when you go to the mediation. So that's basically, oh, there's one last point. Let's go to the next slide. If there is one. Uh, there's not a slide for this, but th there's the, uh, I wanted to touch on the point of competence uh, and when you are practicing outside of your area of expertise and uh, when you wander outside your area of expertise, there are, are pitfalls uh, that you should be aware of and that uh, you should be cognizant of. And I think um, in discussions that we had in preparing for this, I think Carmen had some, uh, some real life examples and some thoughts about this that I think are very useful. So uh, Carmen, do you want to... Uh, make a couple of comments about about that aspect of competence you're on you're on mute carmen carmen you need to unmute yourself carmen i'm trying okay <laughs> I, I, I think i think it's very apropos that we are now going to go into the technology section of our program very nice so. um I, i'm sorry um, I, I, Ed, could you repeat what I had, uh, what you want me to talk about? Because I just got a text about the AB uh, 924 and when, um, uh, so I was, I, I didn't quite hear you because I was looking at the, at this uh, text. 
I'll, uh, I'll, just, I'll just I'll 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 just I'll just quickly repeat that uh, I, I mentioned that in our discussions that you, Chris, and I had in preparing for today, you noted some uh, some real life examples of when uh, uh, there are difficulties that you've seen with uh, lawyers uh, not um, being competent for the areas that they're uh, that they're practicing in and perhaps uh, exceeding the scope of their expertise. I, you know, over the years, I have seen that attorneys that sometimes will do a, a family friend a favor and take on a probate matter that they are, um, you know, not they haven't gotten up to speed on the probate procedures, um, the requirements of filing certain documents, you know, within a certain time frame, uh, with, you know, uh, uh, you know, not understanding the, the the delays can actually prejudice your 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 client. Um I remember specifically years ago, there was a, a case where, um, you know, we had set OSCs with regard to, you know, getting the estate closed, you know, in a timely fashion. Um, and uh, the attorney, you know, just uh, didn't understand that you needed to close it within a certain time frame. And unfortunately, right before uh, he filed his final account, you know, way after the time limit, somebody filed a creditor's claim, which then he had to deal with, which would not have been filed because the, if the estate had been closed timely, um, they would not have had a, a probate estate in which to file it. Um, it was it, it was something that caused an unnecessary expense to the client and to the estate and caused delay in distributing the assets of the estate because then they had to deal with this claim that was filed way beyond the time limit. Um, I, you know, seeing people uh, you know, not realize that they had to get their the letters issued for their client um, once they got appointed administrator executor, and um, and therefore you know didn't realize that you know they the creditors claim period started once the letters were issued and they hadn't gotten the letters issued, so they were again unduly delaying the closing of the estate. Um, it, it you know there are really good resources, uh, probate books, CEB, uh, you know. Uh, rudders, uh, all kinds of, of, of handbooks, you know, uh, the code, which is the first thing I always look at, you know, when I'm looking into a, you know, drafting a petition in a probate case when I was still in practice in many years ago. Um, there are resources, you can get up to speed on things, uh, but you have to actually, you know, do that. And a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of times attorneys are very busy sometimes doing favors for clients, uh, either clients or family members taking on something that they're not really prepared for. Um, and sometimes it's, it's costly. Um, I, I, so let me just I'll give you the information with regard to what um, the text I just received. Um, with regard to AB 924, um, the legislature has, uh, the deadline to introduce bills is, is actually February 16th, 2024. So um, it's 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 within the next month um, that uh, that the deadline is going to occur. Um, back to you, Ed. Okay, thank you. That wraps up the segment on uh, diligence and competence, and I think it's over to Chris to finish it up with a segment on technology. I think that's right. Uh, all right, folks. <laughs> we're, we're one. We're not at the end, but we can see it from here. And two, uh, there is a uh, smile on my face because uh, this is, I, I actually didn't realize I was going to tie this theme in, but it occurs to me when I started off telling you about what we told our children, et cetera. Um, one of the things we also said was do as I say, not as I do at times. And this is one of those where I am uh, talking to you about something that uh, I am no expert. Uh, I struggle with technology and it's and it's almost important that, uh, and I'll just refer to myself as the more senior type person, type attorney. Uh, I graduated law school in 1990. This was not anything as part of our practice. We're going to talk about it. So while earlier comments might have been maybe felt a little bit more directed at, you know, younger attorneys, you know, oh, they're not getting a chance to go into court post COVID, et cetera. I, I think this is geared in particular, this technology section uh to more senior folks like myself so again this is a do as i say not as i do i want to make sure that i don't represent any expertise in that um and in fact so we'll move to the next slide please and unfortunately i was not able to show this video 
uh, apparently because there are, uh, I guess, some copyright issues or some intellectual property a little bit above my pay grade. But if you have not seen it, uh, the, there's a gentleman attorney uh, who I'm presuming is my age or approximately thereof, and he appears on a remote court appearance uh, and he literally is showing up as a cat. And what I mean by that is I guess there are filters and the speculation was that his grandkids have been playing on his computer the night before and said it. And so when you show up on the screen, you look like a cat. And this fine fella could not figure out a way to take it off the screen. And this thing went viral, so I can't show it to you. If you've seen it, I'm sure you cracked up at it. And also it was just painful. And if you haven't, um, what's the old expression on schadenfreude of taking joy in people's misery or whatever as the word, I think there's a little bit of that, but this fella, it, it was, I mean, it was painful to watch. And all I kept thinking is that that could have been me. If there had been a filter on, I wouldn't have known how to take it off. So there was this idea with a posture of, of again, people, my age, you know, I don't need to learn the computer. I don't need to learn the technology. I tried cases back when we had Elmo's and I don't need this. And and frankly, if you're gonna start complying with the rules of professional conduct and being a competent attorney, it's here to stay. And we all know that. I mean, here we are Zooming. And so it's a little bit, um, our message here is we're poking a little bit um, at the more senior folks or the more Luddites or the more tech phobic. Um, Frankly, you, you got to embrace it. You have a rules of professional conduct. If we can go to the next screen, 47, just reemphasizing, uh, including the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. And as we go to a more Zoom like appearances, remote appearances, conducting these kinds of things, um, if you're a practitioner and even if you know, you're you know, older than me, you got to get on board. If you're going to practice, this is part of what the rules of professional conduct uh, require these days. Um, let's uh, let's go on to 48. And uh, Carmen, I note I'm gonna I'm gonna go over it, but I I note I had a little note to myself. I know that you experienced it being on the court end, so you're on mute. I'll give you a chance to get off mute. Um, but on remote appearances, so this happened obviously began with COVID, and I have to confess since I retired as a practicing attorney during COVID. Um, I didn't have to contend with this, though I have many friends who are judges and many friends who are, are practitioners and are, are the judges are very frustrated uh, with folks of our age who aren't uh, grasping and adopting and absorbing that if you're going to do a remote appearance, uh, if you're in San Diego and you're not going to drive up to L.A., and you're going to do a remote appearance, you you have to be ready. It would be like putting on a coat and tie or a appropriate wear. You've that's part of your responsibility of appearing in court. And boy, we have uh, judges. We go to judges night. And this is something that they repeatedly ask us to harp on and to address. And Carmen, I know you have some practical experience with this. Oh, yes. I, I've been in the courtrooms where people are making uh, remote appearances. Actually, uh, some of these were just telephone appearances, but you could hear their dogs in the background. You could hear their little kids uh, running around. Uh, they, all kinds of background noise that made it very difficult for the court to, to be able to listen to them once they were making their appearances. Sometimes because of the delay and actually calling on them, they moved away from their phones. So they, they weren't even there when uh, the court uh, was ready for them. Um, and it, it, you know, technology is daunting for, for a lot of us, um, uh, and uh, myself included. In fact, uh, when I think when uh, Chris asked if I wanted to take the lead on this, and I go, you know, I really don't know that much about technology. So we're all in the same boat. But, you know, we all have to learn. And we all are, you know, reaping the benefits of being able to do these programs by Zoom, having mediations by Zoom, uh, conference calls by Zoom. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm making an effort now every time I don't understand something to, you know, to learn. There are classes, um, the, uh, you know, you can go to the Apple store uh, to, to talk to people um, to learn how to even use your cell phone. So um, there are, there are, and also, you know what I've done? I, I've talked to my friend's kids uh, when I, when I couldn't figure out how to do something, you know, the young people are so, uh, so good at the computer. Um, 
And so I have them explain these things to me as well. So, you know, we all can learn. Um, if, we're, if we're smart enough to be lawyers, uh, with all these years of experience, we're certainly smart enough to learn the technology. So um, I know it, it's daunting because I remember when um, when we first got uh, email, this one attorney had been practiced for many many years. He goes, "I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna use that. I don't know how to use emails." And I, he was, you know, he goes, "You have it, 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 technology can be a really wonderful resource for all of us." So like it says on the on the slide there, don't fight it, learn it. So Chris, I, I would just make one other point that's a little different than using technology ourselves, which is being um, sufficiently conversant with your client's tech, technology systems, how their emails are kept, how they're stored, what yeah. what uh, computer programs they use. Uh, you know, when I was uh, at, at Ticketmaster, part of what I had to do, even though I'm not really uh, close to being uh, a, a, a real uh, a technologist i had to learn at least something about the technology that the company was using uh and how it related to uh, to its lawsuits and uh electronic discovery and so forth so that that's part of this requirement as well right no thank you and let's go to the next slide so uh one of the great things about uh adr is uh we didn't want to just talk about it but here are some uh, best suggestions and practices. This is tips from mediators and you can go to this website. And so if you're trying to figure out how can I maybe use technology better with mediations, um, ADR has resources and we want to offer that to you. So um, we'll give you a second if you need to write that down, but that's a slide. Um, and then uh, we'll move to the next slide. Uh, and so uh, I have, and we're going to talk theoretical framework, and we all have a story. And again, re-emphasizing, if you will, this uh, don't fight it, learn it. So uh, the, the top point that you see, the MySpace story. So I have a story, um, in, I think it was late 2003, early 2004. Uh, MySpace was new on the scene, and that wasn't really anything that I was following as a practicing attorney. Um, I have a client prep, uh, a depot of a PMK who's a safety director, in a, and we had a very large catastrophic accident, big dollars, big complications, uh, lots going on. And so I go meet, as I do, want to go meet and prep with the PMK, the PMQ, if you want, and uh, have all sorts of questions. And it's the safety director, and I'm asking, you know, we, we're going through background, how this is going to go, spend two, three hours getting this uh witness ready uh even ask the is there something i don't know that i should know let me know what can we talk about we get into the depot and again this is 2003 2004 uh, at this point i tried a lot of cases think i know what i'm doing and i get a question in the middle of the depot from counsel that i had worked against many times and in fact have worked with worked against since and we're great friends middle of the depot ask my witness um you know mr x um, are you an alcoholic? And I about jumped out of my seat. It's one of the few, what in the world, objection, improper, I want basis. We, we go off the record. Um, I then learned that the MySpace page of this particular safety director announces his big party lifestyle. I'm a workaholic, alcoholic, proud of it. I go hard, play hard, and all of this stuff. And it's just out there. And so this attorney then said, I'm not the one who raised it. I'm trying to find out this. It was as painful and surprising a depot uh, for me. And I just didn't realize that this was something that could enter into our depositions. And so, um, you know, when you prep your clients, so, and I'm sure you folks already know this, but when you prep your clients, you're getting ready. Boy, you want to find out about their social media presence. Um, I have stories the other way where I, I, spent two, three hours walking folks through who were making claims when I was a practicing attorney. Um, gosh, you went to the doctor here. This is what you told the doctor. Gosh, here's on your social media that night, you're doing this. And then were you doing this? And were you doing this? And, and it got very painful for lots of folks um, because of their social media presence. So, uh, you know, we, we attorneys, and I'm sure it's in the, the zeitgeist and ethos of practicing law these days, but people still get surprised by it. I'm surprised by the degree to which attorneys don't 
familiarize themselves with their client or their witnesses or the witness they're deposing their social media presence because it has a lot of information so um you know we didn't we didn't learn this in law school this isn't anything at least for practitioners of my ilk this is not something that we were raised with it doesn't come at least i'll speak for me intuitively and didn't but but we have to learn to absorb it because it's here it would be i i would say a hundred years ago, if you had attorneys, well, I'm not going to learn this telephone. You know, if someone wants me, they can send me a letter. It's like, no, that's the technology. And that's how we're communicating these days. And you got to get with it. And so I just wanted to hit again on that part of it. If you're uncomfortable with it, it's not going to get any better if you avoid it. So lean into it. So I, uh, Ed or Carmen, would you have anything that you would want to add, uh, comment on? Uh, of anything I said here. I, I think you covered it. Okay. Uh, I think we're going into the next slide. I know we're, we've got a little time. So uh, uh, in terms of closing thoughts, um, I, I feel like the presenters, I, I don't feel like I need to recap anything I said. I didn't know. I don't know if Ed or Carmen feel like they need to. And if you do, why don't we just run through all 50 slides right now just to make sure everyone's got it. <laughs> um, we have a bit of time. Um, so uh, if it's okay with you speakers, I'd like to run through some questions that we have and we have uh, plenty of questions to run through. Um, this one is a lengthy one. So let me, uh, please allow me to read it real quick. Um, it says, hi, Hayward. Uh, I'd like to ask a mediation, mediation question to the panelists, specifically in this individual fields, that often mediators are often reluctant to provide their take or opinion of the strengths and weaknesses of a party's position, chances of success in the case because mediators state they are concerned that such an assessment, even when expressly requested by a participant in a non-joint confidential setting, um, this individual finds that it's very frustrating Oftentimes, the parties, uh, at least privately, need to hear straight uh, talk, brutal honesty from the mediator. More and more, however, mediators refuse to take any such position, um, even when expressly asked, but instead just focus on conveying the other party's position. But the parties already know the other side's position. The question is, what is important, crucial to settlement, is getting an unbiased opinion from a neutral? How can parties ensure that a mediator will give his or her honest take on the case? Mm. That's a great question. I have I have thoughts, which is I'm not I'm not bashful in mediation, so I'll just talk for me. Uh, I'm not bashful at all. Um, I I don't want to do it prematurely. I don't want to come out swinging like I've read the briefs and boy, I have all the opinions in the world. I want to gather information. I want to meet with the parties. I want to talk to them. I want to identify risk assessment. What's the strength of your case? What's the weakness of your case? Um, I, I, and I don't mean to, I, if there are mediators who won't give their opinions and give you an assessment of what they think the strengths and weaknesses of your case are, that surprises me because that's the risk assessment. I think that mediators, uh, that, that you want from a mediator. So I, I just do it as a, as a part of practice. I do ask for permission. Hey, do you mind if I weigh in? I don't just go right over the top on folks. Um, and I'll do that even eventually with a mediator proposal down the road, if we if we are so far apart, but the parties are interested, I always ask permission. I, so um, I could imagine your frustration. I would have been frustrated as a practicing attorney if I hired a mediator who wasn't willing to tell me the truth if my case had strengths or weaknesses. I, I don't need any, I wouldn't need anyone tickling my ears. And if the goal is to get the case settled, which is why you hire a mediator, you don't hire a mediator to get you close, you hire them to settle your case. So they should tell you what they think. I mean, if asked, if appropriate, not too early and not, you know, as if uh, you have all the information in your opinion is the most important, but that you've taken some observations, you're taking in your experience and your observations and then putting it on them. But, well yeah. said. I agree totally. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that too. General, generally speaking, I mean, I'm not going to be I'm not going to be bashful about being honest with the uh, with the attorneys and share my my views, but it's all how and when you do it and to do it with with care, because if you do it, like you say, prematurely, you can really um, or, or if you issue a mediator's proposal without 
having thought it through and uh, and done the foundational work for it, you can do great damage. But uh, I'm not I'm one of the reasons why I, I, I'm there, I think, is to provide my uh, assessment of things. And uh, I don't want to put my thumb on the scale, but I do want to share what my you know, what my perceptions of the strengths and weaknesses of the case are, but to do it at to do it carefully and at the right time. I, I agree with that. Um, you know, that it, that is one of the reasons that, you know, you hire somebody. That's why we have so many experienced mediators. Uh, you, you have seasoned, experienced attorneys uh, and judges that are mediators. And one of the reasons that you're going to mediation um, is, is to have the benefit of our years of experience uh, in, in seeing cases uh, and the outcomes of, um, of these cases in court. And, and I agree with Ed, you know, timing is important. Uh, I, I, I agree with, with Chris too, it, timing is important. You need to know when to do that, um, but not to offer your, your assessment when you're being asked. I, I just don't see how that can be helpful. Um, along, uh, going on and talking about more intermediations, um, is it counterproductive to submit a very lengthy brief with over 30 exhibits? I think it depends on the case. I, I don't know that it's counterproductive. It may or may not be useful or necessary, but uh, I, 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 I can't see it being counterproductive as long as what you really want the mediator to focus on is, is highlighted and made clear so that the, the, the mediator doesn't get lost in the weeds. Well, I agree with that. You know, I, I don't see that any harm in, in having a lot of exhibits. Sometimes it's it's good to be able to go and, and look at a particular one. I think when you're drafting a mediation brief, um, I you know, I I, I, I mentioned this um, in some of the presentations I've done about you know how to draft a readable petition for court review. Um, you know, your, your mediation brief should be uh, the same. You, you you should get to the point right away. Uh, you know, uh, you know, indicate who all the parties are. Uh, indicate what you know what the controversy is. Uh, I think it, it, there should be at least a brief summary at the beginning of your brief um, to to help us. You know, especially you know, depending on, on the time constraints that we have, you know, and how much time we have to read it before the mediation. I, I even if you submit it five days ahead of the mediation, it, it doesn't hurt to, to give us a brief summary at the very beginning and then just go into the details after that. So, you know, give us an idea who the parties are, you know, uh, you know, what the controversy is, uh, you know, why you think your your side should win, what are the code sections or laws or cases that support your position. And then, you know, attaching exhibits, um, you know, I always like if, if I've got a a, a matter that's contesting an accounting. Uh, I always want to see a copy of the accounting attached to the the, the brief. That's always helpful. Um, and there may be other documents that I, that that you think are helpful. You know, and it, it gives the mediator the ability to look at whatever they want to look at in order to be prepared for the mediation. Well, the thing I would add, and Carmen, you hit the first point. But I would just want to reiterate it. If you do that, um, the sooner you get it to your mediator, the more likely you're going to have those exhibits read and consumed and uh, appreciated by the mediator. So that would be the first thing. If you do it, like I said, if you if you do it on the morning of. Secondly, I would think if you're doing lots of exhibits, my request would be at least give me guidance. Don't like, we've got a great case in the exhibits. So look at exhibit A, this is for liability and you don't explain that. And I've had folks where they're, they're given it last minute and maybe not the best effort on the brief. And you think, okay, I'm, I'm having to, uh, create and absorb your case without any guidance from you. And I would appreciate it knowing that because you've had the case for a year or two. So at least tell me why these were important exhibits as opposed to me having to figure out why they're important. That would be my comment. Perfect. Maybe one or two more questions. Um, how does absolute confidentiality of, me of the mediation process play into reporting? So if a misconduct occurs in mediation, then is reporting even allowed? I think that it's not allowed. Um, I think you would need something beyond the what happens in the mediation that, because the media there's mediation confidentiality. It's kind of like um, you know, 
it's like the in criminal law, fruit of the poisonous tree. You need to show that you've discovered it some some way other than through the mediation. I think that was my take from the from the rules, um, but uh, and the comments. But that that's an interesting point. I, I, I thought about that. I, I think that's the answer. But uh, in all honesty, I'm not 110 percent sure. Any other comments? I was sorry, Carmen, I don't mean to be your. Do you have anything on the mediation, you know, the confidentiality, anything that you gleaned from uh, that part? You know, I, 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 I'm going to go with what Ed said. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure. Yeah. I, Maybe I, that I, wasn't the question to ask. <laughs> I, I guess, I, I, no, I think I think that's an excellent question. I I, I think that's the answer, but I'm not going to no. stake my law license on it. No. I would I would want to research that further. I mean, the rule is kind of new. I would like to get some more guidance on that. Maybe that'll be the subject of the next uh, ethics program we present. All right. Well, with that being said, why don't we conclude the two-hour ethics program? Uh, thank you, Carmen, Ed, and Chris uh, for that very detailed and very needed uh, program. Um, and thank you all for joining us this morning. Uh, please note that the next presentation will begin promptly at 1220. And again, meanwhile, please enjoy the following slideshow. Thank you, Carmen and Chris. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. ADR Services, Inc. has been your unwavering partner in alternative dispute resolution. But as the world changed, so did we. From virtual and hybrid hearings to our ongoing on-demand CLE program, ADR Services, Inc. continues to keep resolution and legal education at the forefront, woman owned and operated from the start. There is someone for every situation. We are ADR Services, Inc.